trespass against us, and lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please be, please be seated. Please be seated. Today's message is titled, The Pharisees at the End of the Book. Did y'all ever read the book, The Monster at the End of the Book with Grover? Nobody? I'm grateful. I am grateful because that was one of my favorite books as a child. And I remember mom reading it to me, and I remember reading it when I was able to read. And I always loved it because at the very back of it, the very end of it, there's this mirror page. And it's like, the monster might be you. And I thought that was the coolest thing, that I could be a monster. And you all are going, that is not that much of a stretch. And one of the things I love about being a monster is the monster gets gifts. There is a clock at the back of the sanctuary now. I'm waiting for the bells and whistles and the flags to go off when it's close to time to, to stop talking. But today's scripture lesson is 2 Timothy 3, 14 through 17. 2 Timothy 3, 14 through 17. And as we get ready to read that, please bow your heads. Heavenly Father, as we begin to listen to your word and hear your message, please allow us to open our ears, open our minds, open our hearts, and open every aspect of our lives to your will, to your heart, to your words. In your name we pray. Amen. So today's message, again, is 2 Timothy 3, 14 through 17. If you don't have your Bible, break out that Bible app on the cell phone. If you don't have a Bible app, um, you need to get one. 2 Timothy 3, 14 through 17. But don't let it phase you. Stick with what you learned and believed, sure of the integrity of your teachers. Why you took, the sac- why you took in the sacred scriptures with your mother's milk, there's nothing like the written word of God for showing you the way to salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Let's do that one more time. There's nothing, nothing like the written word of God for showing you the way to salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Every part of Scripture is God-breathed and useful one way or another, showing us truth, exposing our rebellion, correcting our mistakes, training us to live God's way through the word as we put together and shaped up for the task of God as he has for us. And amen. And so is today's today's message, today's word. Don't let it phase you. There's nothing like the written word of God for showing you the exact way to salvation through faith, through faith in Christ Jesus. So we've been talking about beliefs. And it's about the first time, first week we talked about who is God. And not just who is God, but who is our God? Who is your God? Who is my God? Because sometimes our God is not exactly God. Sometimes we put something else up there. But then there's the idea of God wants a personal relationship with you. We talked about that. Every part of Scripture is God-breathed and useful one way or another, showing us the truth exposing our rebellion, correcting our mistakes, training us to live God's way, not our way. Because salvation, as we talked about last week, with the message titled, The Peanut Butter Banana Burger, that monstrosity of a burger. Salvation. Salvation is only, there's only one way. And then through the word, we are put together and shaped up for the task God has for us. And it's not to be the monsters at the end of the book. I heard this story recently. I was talking to somebody who works with the down and out locally. And he was telling me about a conversation he had with a woman who um, has a scandalous reputation. She's one of the local prostitutes. And that prostitute came to this gentleman in wretched straits, homeless, sick, unable to buy food for her two-year-old daughter. 
through sobs and tears, she had told this gentleman how she had been renting out her two-year-old daughter because she could make more money renting out her daughter for an hour than she could make on her own in an entire night. And she felt she had to do it. She told the gentleman that uh, to support her drug habit, she had to do it. And I could barely listen to the story he was telling me. And he said it was through tears. And he had no idea what, at the time, what he was going to say to this woman. Last, he asked her if she had ever thought of going to a church for help. And really, you ready for the answer? She goes, church? Why would I go there? I already feel horrible about myself. They're just going to make me feel worse. Something is very wrong with church today. We've all forgotten about God's amazing grace. We've been infiltrated with a heart of the Pharisees, of a mind of the Pharisees where it's not so much about learning who God is as learning how to sing a song or get to the church. We really don't understand who God is. It's like God is a Facebook acquaintance. We know him. We know of him. We just don't know him. And it wasn't just a problem in church today. It was a problem way, way back then, just as it is today. The fact is, the Bible teaches us that we are saved by God's grace, alone, through God's grace, through faith in Christ alone. However, however, much like that woman at the beginning, who, why would I go there? They're just going to make me feel worse. We must be aware and beware of the spirits of the Pharisees because they're going to try to keep us in bondage. They try to keep us subject, subjected to their will, their whim, their thumb because it's not about God for them. They're going to try to keep us from experiencing God's grace. And sometimes that Pharisee spirit is in our own hearts as we. We might not blatantly, overtly say, I'm going to totally defy God, but through that spirit of the Pharisees, we live a life that is anti-God. It's what we really believe in our heart. That's what's important. What do you truly believe in your heart? Are you a Pharisee or are you a follower of Christ? So what is a Pharisees? I love that word, Pharisees. That's why it's the Pharisees at the end of the book. Because sometimes it doesn't matter what the book is. It's, it's who's holding it, who's at the end of that book. In Matthew 9, 11, the Pharisees are the ones that criticize Jesus for hanging out with the sinners, with those people that like to sit up until 2 o'clock in the morning, drinking and boozing and carousing, tax collectors, prostitutes, Drug dealers, stinky people, messy people, people that listen to that gangster rap. I love gangster rap. I'm trying to get everybody to wear Easy E t-shirts. Can we all do that once? Just wear Easy E, maybe, you know, some Pink Floyd the Wall, maybe something really good. Because they, Pharisees, they didn't believe who God was. And they criticized Jesus for hanging out with people that did not live up to their standards. They did not, they were, he was hanging out with sinners. They judged Jesus and his disciples for working on the Sabbath. How dare you do God's work? How dare you heal people on the Sabbath? That's totally against what our rules are. Our rules should trump what God wants. That's the Pharisees. They plotted and schemed how they might destroy Jesus. As soon as he healed the man, the Pharisees immediately started plotting in their head how they were going to kill Christ. And he asked them the question, why are you thinking what you're thinking in your heart? In Matthew 15, 6, they made God's word, they made God's word ineffective because their traditions, what they've done in the past, what they used to control people was more important than a relationship with God to them. The Pharisees were an elite ancient group of religious people who were strict adherents to the law, and they esteemed themselves more highly than the others. They thought they were better than everybody else. They were the most educated of the Jews, and they spent their lives in the study of the Torah. They believed the law 
Their law was the only way to God. Who are the Pharisees today? Because they exist today. Some of the Pharisees today believe themselves to be loftier than all others. Some judge others and their observance of law and often put themselves in the position of judge and jury and executioner. Just as we see in the New Testament story of the woman that was caught in adultery, some have a spirit of haughtiness, self-righteousness, pride, and hypocrisy. They believe the rules that they wanted everybody else to live by didn't apply to them because they were better, they were more learned than everybody else. And strangely, all the rules that they had everybody else to live by didn't apply to them. And all their traditions of the past were not necessarily about worshiping God. Some were offended by everyone and everything that does not believe exactly as they believe, regardless of how biblically sound it is or regardless of how biblically unsound their beliefs are. Some are so full of themselves that they could not recognize the Messiah if he stood right in front of them because he doesn't fit their idea of what the Messiah ought to be. Let's just stone him. That's going to mean everybody else is going to just fall in line because they'll see we mean business. Let's stone this guy. A Pharisee spirit is one who believes they somehow do faith better than everybody else. They judge people for what they wear, what they drive, what church they go to, how often they pray, what version of the Bible they read, who they associate with. They criticize others for not reading the Bible as much as they do, for not understanding as much as they do, for not being able to recite as much as they can. They read the Bible, but they don't really believe what they're reading because their lives do not reflect it. Their hearts do not reflect it. So I ask you again, are you a follower of Christ or are you a Pharisee? Because a follower of Christ, there's only one goal for a follower of Christ. See, the goal of a Christian life is not to be the smartest about biblical knowledge or about anything else. It's not about showing up in church more often than anybody else. It's not about what you do, how much you give. The goal of the Christian life is simply all about who you are becoming. All about who you are becoming for the sake of others. God's hope for you is that you will think like Jesus, act like Jesus, and become like Jesus in every single part of your life for the sake of others. And I can hear you all thinking, surely he's not talking about us. We we outnumber the people on the other side of the church. He's talking about them. All the good people are over here. All the good people over there are going, you know what? All the sinners are over there. He's not talking about us. I'm a good person. I couldn't possibly be a Pharisee. He couldn't. He, did you even see the pastors wearing blue jeans? But did you check out my boots? These are some awesome boots. He shouldn't even be wearing blue jeans when he's preaching the word of God. I have more education than anybody else here. I do more in the community than anybody I know. I give more money to the church. It ought to do more of what I want to do. But what does it really mean to be a disciple of Christ? And part of what we're doing with all of this is we're examining our beliefs to paint a picture of what exactly it means to think like Christ, act like Jesus Christ, and be like Jesus Christ. We're looking at our our beliefs, what we actually believe in our hearts, because that's where our lives are dictated from. That's where we live. We looked at our beliefs when it comes to who God is, the fact he wants a personal relationship with us, and our beliefs when it comes to salvation. Our beliefs are important. And hopefully, you're thinking about what exactly it is you believe and why you do what you do, because it matters. This morning, as we continue in our focus, it's about our belief in the Bible. Do you believe the Bible is the inspired word of God and has the right to guide your very word, your very words, and your actions? It seems simple enough, but here's the thing. 
A lot of times we only want to give the book the right to guide our lives if we truly believe it is from God, that it truly is God speaking to us. Sadly, there are many in the world today who don't see the Bible in that light. They challenge its authenticity, arguing that it isn't possibly for it to be true or historically accurate after all these years, or that it's just a bunch of made-up fairy tales and stories by people who lived a long, long time ago. And it doesn't really apply to us. It's just a storybook. So, do you believe? Is the Bible historically accurate? Can it be trusted? Let's begin by looking at some of what Jesus tells us in the Bible. St. Peter writes, For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses. We were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by majestic glory, and remember, when he was baptized by John the Baptist, there was the dove, there was the voice from above, and the voice said, this is my son. This is my beloved son, whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard that very voice. It continues. For we were with him on the holy mountain. Y'all remember that game, Telephone? where you know, it starts out, you say one thing, and it goes around the room, and by the time it gets to the end, it says something different. You, know, you start out going, you know, the volunteers are overrated. And by the time it gets back, it says volunteers beat the, um, beat the mountaineers. You know, totally, totally different stories. If you hear someone recounting an event that you witnessed, and their vision and their version doesn't exactly line up with yours, if you witness something that happens and somebody tells you a story and you know it doesn't line up with what you saw, what is your response going to be? Now, I don't know about you, but I'm going to speak up. Take the four Gospels, for example. Did you know that most historians believe that both Matthew and Luke's Gospels are written about three, maybe four decades after Jesus' departure from earth? As these accounts circulated, don't you think that some of those who knew the truth, that somebody would have, been, would have demanded changes if these events were fictional? Jesus had four half-brothers and at least two half-sisters, according to Matthew 13. And tradition says that, Matthew li or that Mary lived until about A.D. 63. If the events described weren't accurate, if they weren't totally accurate, don't you think that his friends or family would have protested their inclusion in those writings? But what about all the copies of the scripture over the years? Wouldn't it be like that game of telephone that we talked about just now? Surely some of the things evolved, changed, or were embellished over time. I love, Dad, I'm throwing you under the bus. I love hearing Dad's stories about when he was in, in the army because every single time the story changes. And that story gets embellished a little bit more. And mom just rolls her eyes. And I love the stories. But don't you think that something has, if it was embellished, if it was not true, if they were changed, that somebody would have said something other than mom's eyes rolls? Did you know that there are more cooperating manuscripts of the Holy Scripture at least, there's one dating back at least to the 100s that support and reinforce the scripture. According to one source, there are roughly 24,000 assorted ancient scripture manuscripts and a variety of ancient languages, such as Greek, Hebrew, Latin, and so on, that span the centuries. By comparison, there are only 30 verifi verifiable copies of Plato's writings and only nine copies of the Jewish war by the first century writer Josephus. And keep in mind that back then, there was a remarkably high demand for accuracy with the word of God. So it was carried, it was copied with care and diligence. 
And you can find other similar books, you know, either books or online resources. But if God, if, if it's going to change, if it's going to guide our lives, we need to take, you know, a question of the, validi- of the val- validity. Debbie, can you say validity? Validity and authority of Scripture one step further. Because there are so many that are going to ask the question, what is the big deal? There are many who are going to say, I'm making too big of a deal over the authority and validity of the Holy Bible. They argue that as long as I believe that Jesus is my Savior, that he died on the cross to take away my sin, and he rose again from the dead, that's all I really need. Anything else? The creation account. Noah, Jonah, David, Goliath, the miracles of Christ, the teachings of St. Paul. Is it really all that important to believe that those are really the words of God and not just some fanciful myth or some popular story of some ancient culture that are hardly relevant today? And it's that mindset in our world today that has led many to see the Bible as nothing more than a spiritual buffet where we get to pick and choose what we read and believe, much less what we obey. For many, it all depends on what you find convenient or helpful. Those are the parts that are, that are deemed acceptable. I'd suggest to you that regarding the Christian faith and the authority of the Bible, while it's been under attack, To a greater or lesser degree over the centuries, it seems that in recent years, even good, God-fearing Christians have fallen into that same trap that Eve fell into with Satan, where Satan asked Eve, did God really say, hmm? In fact, there are some churches that teach that the Bible contains, contains the word of God. Think about it. The Bible contains the Word of God. Not that the Bible is the Word of God, but that the Bible contains the Word of God. And think about the ramifications of such an approach, such a belief. First and most basic, if I accept the idea that there are parts of the Bible that are not true, and that I can choose to not believe certain parts of the Bible, then how can I really believe any of it? And I mean, believe it to the point where it has the ability to be the Lord over my words and my actions. One of the biggest challenges for so many people is when Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. Many in our world today find that problematic. They say, if there is a heaven, there's got to be other ways. There has to be other ways to get there. Maybe if I do more good deeds. Maybe if I'm just a nice person. Maybe if I just give more to the church or if I'm an ethical person. Pastor, you can't say that Jesus is the only way. First of all, I'm not the one saying it. Jesus is. But if I can't take that at face value as truth, then how can I take anything else about the Bible that tells me about how Jesus is the truth, is the way, and is the life, and that no one comes to the Father except through him? How can I believe why he even came to earth? How can I believe that he died on a cross to pay for my sin, that he came to the cross to pay pay for your sin? He was sitting in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he was praying so hard. His little sweat bubble, little sweat droplets were coming down like drops of blood. And he sat there, and he said, can you please take this cup any other way? Great, let's do it. Take this cup from me. Let it pass. And he said, and he prayed, and he thought about everybody that does believe in him, did believe in him, and will believe in him. And he saw you, and he saw every single sin you will ever commit. And he'd love you so much, he chose the nails, knowing how you would live your life. How can you say that Jesus is the only way? I don't. He does. 
How can I believe why he came to earth? How can I believe that he died on the cross to pay for my sin? Or that I even need a Savior? Do I even really need a Savior? How can I believe that he rose again in victory over death, guaranteeing my victory over death and securing my place in heaven? To take the spiritual buffet approach, to say that only part of the Bible that is true and necessary begs the question, which part? And how do I know for sure? The St. Paul writes in 2 Timothy 3, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in a righteous life, that the man of God may be complete as God intends us, equipped for every good work. Now, some some translations say all Scripture is inspired by God, but the more accurate translation of the Greek is literally God-breathed, the very breath of God. The breath of life permeates the Holy Scriptures. He may have used imperfect humans to write down his words. He may use imperfect humans to carry out his will, and he does, because there is no one that is righteous here on earth. But his Holy Spirit guided them, and what they wrote is truth. All of it is truth, 100%. And it's interesting that just a few sentences later, in that letter to, Tim, you know, that letter to Timothy, St. Paul writes this, for the time will come, let's see if this rings true, if, if this sounds familiar to you, the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine, when people will not put up with the actual word of God. They will accumulate for themselves. They will find teachers that will teach them exactly what they want to hear to suit their own desires and turn away from listening to the truth and wander away to myths. It's almost like he got a glimpse into 2021, isn't it? And that's why it doesn't really matter if I pile up evidence to support historical accuracy of the Bible. Because ultimately, it's not about piling up historical accuracy. Ultimately, it's a matter of the heart. It's one thing to believe it's the right answer. It's one thing to believe that it's the word of God in your head. But it's another thing when you let that belief travel those 12 inches down. If I had a heart, it'd be right there. If it traveled down to your heart, ultimately, it's a matter of what you have in your heart. Whether or not one sees the Bible as valid and valuable or not, really has nothing to do with data. It might help in some situations when you're talking about it with somebody else, but ultimately it's all about what's in your heart, about the willingness to accept that I don't have all the right answers. You don't have all the right answers. Mom, Dad knows you don't have all the right answers. I'm never going to say that about me, though. I don't have all the right answers that I do need help, that you do need help, we all need help, that there is a heaven and a hell and all of the rest of the stuff. It's a matter of trusting not only that it is God speaking to us, all of it, but also that those words are for my benefit and for my blessing. And that's finally what Jesus is talking about when he says with with the parable of the wise and foolish builder, And Jesus is saying that God's word, his word, because Jesus is God, his word, his very word in our, his very word in our hearts prepares us for the storms of life. His word prepares us for the storms of life. And trusting in that word is true and right and good is especially helpful for when our feelings or emotions try to challenge what God says when we're in the middle of those storms. For me, it's when somebody cuts me off in traffic or when somebody has 17,000 items at Walmart and they're trying to check out and the three items are less line. Or when somebody is at the gas pump paying in quarters. There's the word that's very interesting. Or when my Wi-Fi goes down again because I need a new router the storms of life, whatever they may be. And all of us have storms of life. 
But how do we react when we encounter those storms of life? Because if you really believed that the Bible is the word of God speaking to you, how would you react in those storms? Do you believe that the Bible has an answer to every single topic or discussion or challenge we are ever going to encounter in this life? Specifically, maybe no. I don't remember there ever being anything mentioned about routers in the Bible. But for every challenge, for every question, there is a universal truth in God's word that does apply. And as we take it to heart and study it regularly, faithfully, deeply, intimately, we see some core truths that become the solid foundation that Jesus speaks of. There is a God. He loves us and desires a personal relationship with us, every one of us. Doesn't matter if you're the drug dealer. Doesn't matter if, if you have a porn addiction. Doesn't matter if you go home and drink a 12-pack of beer every night. It doesn't matter if you come to church smelling stinky. All of us are spiritually stinky. Welcome to the farm. We all sin. Actions, thoughts that separate us. See, the thing is, we all think that their sin is, is worse than our sin. You know, we point at each other and go, I know your sin. My sin's better than your sin. I just got patience. You've got this. But it doesn't matter because every single time we sin, whatever that sin is, it just takes us one step further away from God. Doesn't matter if it's adultery. Doesn't matter if it's murder. Doesn't matter if it's lying. Doesn't matter if it's gossip. Doesn't matter if it's gluttony. Doesn't matter if it's sloth. Every single sin is seen as equal in God's eyes. But he loves us. And he desires a personal relationship with each and every one of us. And all we have to do is confess with our lips and have faith in our hearts. And we find salvation. Doesn't matter how messed up we are. We can't save ourselves. We can't restore that relationship with God by ourselves. God did do something about it, though. He sent his only son to the cross to die and take our punishment upon himself and raised him back to life to confirm his victory over sin and death. And imagine, unlike regular people sitting around us, visiting us online, whatever the case might be, he is never, ever, ever going to give up on us. And that relationship isn't just for today. It's for now, and it's for eternity. This week and in the days to come, we need to ask ourselves, do I actually believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God and has the right to guide my words and my actions? And if so, how do I respond? What is my takeaway this week? If I believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God, and it is God talking to us, has the right to guide my words and actions. How do I respond this week? Has anybody ever had to put together something on like Christmas Eve? Who here has kids and grandkids? So do you remember putting stuff together on Christmas Eve, whether it's a bicycle, a train set, a race car set, a dollhouse, whatever the case might be? And you remember how, Karen, Frank never looked at directions, did he? Never. And he would say the most foulest things on Christmas Eve. And I'm sure he had a couple of beer while he's doing it because he was getting frustrated after frustrated. I wondered how come Santa Claus would drink a beer or, or talk such a way when, when I was growing up. No, that never happened in my house. I was always asleep. But we never read the directions. Now imagine you buy a car. You look in the manual. All you care about, where's the key go? Where's the radio? How do I open the trunk? Where's the gas cap? You don't care about all those lights on the dashboard that light up going, by the way, you need to put oil in. Or by the way, your tire pressure is now seven. <laughs> if you ignore those instructions, if I just pick and choose those things which are convenient, those things which are easy, like how to turn on the radio, 
how to start the car, how to open the trunk, but disregard other things like those warning lights on my dashboard or the need to change the oil or other similar maintenance, what's the result going to be? I can do what the manual says, or I can ignore it and do whatever I want. The choice really is up to us as an individual. The results, however, are going to determine the wisdom of my choices. Has anybody ever had a friend, anybody other than me, have a friend that realized a little too late that you need to put oil in a car? Glenn is not watching this back home and in, in, on the Baltimore area. I still remember him going, you know, I never knew I had to put oil in this thing. After that engine blew up. Love you, Glenn. The ignorance of youth. We have a choice. We can follow the manual. We can listen to what God wants us to hear. We can believe that it is God talking to us, or we cannot. The results are going to determine the wisdom of our choices. The bottom line, if I trust God for my eternity, believing in Jesus so that I can get to heaven, then as hard as it might be sometimes, I can trust him and his guidance for my daily living that I find in his word, knowing that just as an earthly father loves his son, his daughter, enough to provide the best guidance the best direction, even more, our Heavenly Father loves us and gives us all we need for life, for this life, for the next life. May the Lord give us the courage and the confidence to believe that, but more importantly, to act on it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please bow your heads. God hears our cries and the cries of our hearts, sees our actions, knows our attitudes, and in the midst of our sinfulness, God reaches out to heal and to forgive.